Well, good morning. Let me ask you a question. Over the course of a day, how many decisions do you think you make? Over the course of a day. See, there was one Columbia Business School researcher found, did some research and found that the average person makes about 70 different decisions in a day. So that's about 25,000 uh, a year. So if you lived about 70 years, you're looking at close to 2 million decisions. 2 million different decisions that you'll make over the course of a lifetime. Now, of course, many of these decisions um, aren't that important. Many of them don't have uh, moral implications. Um, you know, getting up in the morning, deciding which socks to wear, that's not that important. <laughs> I lied, that might be important. <laughs> but what you're gonna have for dinner, uh, the route you're going to take for work. Some of these decisions really have you know, no moral implications. But what about those decisions that are important? The ones that do have moral implications. The moral ones that we're faced with. The, the, the ones that do matter. Now, so if you're a businessman, what about facing a dilemma like this? Should I lie to the customer and get the sale? Or should I be honest with the customer and glorifying God, even though I know I might lose the sale? Should I cheat on my taxes and owe a little less to Uncle Sam? After all, they take a lot of our money to begin with. Or should I be honest and have a clear conscience before others and before the Lord? Should I let my child get involved in another activity on Sunday mornings that, that will take up that, that meaningful time of worship? Or do I tell my child no? because I want to teach my child the importance of putting God first in all areas of life. Should I sneak away to watch those adult videos in secret? Or should I close the tab on the computer and get on the phone and, and call a brother or sister who could hold me accountable? Should I post this inappropriate but funny meme on social media? Or should I refrain from posting it because it might damage my Christian witness? Should I flirt back? with that cute person at work. Because, man, my spouse really isn't meeting my needs, and I desire to be wanted. Or do I honor God by just getting my work done and, and honoring my marriage vows? Do I accept Jesus' invitation of salvation, or do I reject it, convincing myself that it's just a bunch of fairy tales? See, when you take these choices together and choices like them, they're going to determine the kind of life you're going to live and maybe even where you'll be spending eternity. So in fact, what we're going to learn today in Proverbs chapter 9 is that your destiny is determined by your decisions. Your destiny is determined by your decisions. The direction that your life takes is determined by the decisions that you make. So this morning, as we continue our study in Proverbs, the, we're calling this sermon series Wide, Wise Words, we come to Proverbs chapter 9, and we're going to see this truth expanded upon for us. So Proverbs 9 is, is a graphic illustration of the importance of making good choices, the importance of making wise decisions in life. And remember, when we're reading through the book of Proverbs, we're reading the wise teachings of a father showing his son what it means to live with skill in godly living, what it means to pursue wisdom throughout all areas of life. Well, in Proverbs chapter 9, we have this portrait of two women competing for the attention and the affection of the son. One woman named Wisdom, and another woman named Folly. See, on, if you picture in your mind the son walking down a road, he's walking down this road, and on opposite sides of the road are two different houses. One house belongs to the elegant Lady Wisdom. The other house belongs to the seductive Madam Folly. And both of them are offering, extending an invitation for the son and for all of us, to join their relative feasts. They're each offering an invitation to join them at their house to, to, to feast on the food that they're preparing. So just as an overview of where we're uh, going in Proverbs 9, we're going to look at, we're gonna look at um, a lady wisdom in the first six verses. We're going to contrast her with Madam Folly uh, in verses 13 through 18. Then we're going to come back to the middle of the chapter to see what's going on there. So as we start reading about Lady Wisdom and her banquet in these first six verses, what we're going to see is that accepting the invitation of wisdom leads to a life of satisfaction. 
Accepting the invitation of wisdom leads to a life of satisfaction. And there's really two dimensions to this satisfaction. There's the satisfaction that we experience in the here and now. In other words, wisdom promises a fulfilling life. This is the current dimension of, of that satisfaction. That wisdom promises a fulfilling life. And this is what we see in the first two verses. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 9 verse 1. It says, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. Now, women don't normally build houses, but as we'll see as we continue on this passage, this is no ordinary woman that Solomon's talking about. See, Lady Wisdom has built an inviting and spacious house, a house supported by seven pillars. Now, what you have to understand is that in ancient times, a house with pillars was owned by, by someone of wealth, someone of much affluence. So in these large houses, it was common to have a courtyard in the center of the house with an open passageway that led to the courtyard, uh, but the, obviously the outside of the house was enclosed to allow protection, but the inside was very spacious and very inviting. So it would have been the pillars that held up the roof in that open courtyard in the house. And some archaeologists have suggested that a wealthy person's house would have had three pillars, here we see that Lady Wisdom's house, probably more like a palace, is supported by seven pillars. Now seven here is a metaphorical number for completeness and perfection. This would mean that Lady Wisdom is incredibly wealthy, that she lacks no resources, that there's nothing that her guests will want for. Not only that, but her house is so large that she can invite in whoever she wants. There's room for everybody. Nobody will be turned away at the door. Okay, so she built her house. Well, and then the passage goes on, and we see that the look, we see, uh, we learn all about the luxurious menu that she's created, that she's put together for her guests in verse two. It says, she has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. So the, what's going on here is Lady Wisdom has personally gone into the slaughterhouse. She's personally butchered all the animals, and she's likely taken the best cuts of meat for this feast. And then she's taken the finest of her wines, mixed it with some spices to make the wine taste even better, and then she has set her table. So just imagine the spread on this table. In fact, if Lady Wisdom's uh, feast were a restaurant, I bet you it would be number one on Vinnie Mastrodi's list of restaurant recommendations. <laughs> See, all of this imagery here is teaching us that what wisdom has to offer is marvelous, that wisdom promises a fulfilling and abundant life. What are some of the benefits of wisdom, though? Well, if you were to flip throughout the pages of Proverbs, here's a small list of some of the benefits of wisdom that you'd get. Proverbs chapter 2, wisdom helps you perceive what is right and good and fair. Also in Proverbs chapter 2, wisdom prevents you from engaging in self-destructive behavior. Proverbs chapter 3, wisdom brings peace of mind. Wisdom enables you to remain calm and confident in the midst of chaos. Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom helps you exercise caution and hold back when necessary. Proverbs chapter 11, wisdom helps you get along with others. Proverbs 13, wisdom positions you to be humble and teachable. Proverbs 14, wisdom aids you in finding favor in the workplace. Proverbs 16, wisdom helps you pacify another person's anger. Proverbs 24, wisdom assists you with building strong family relationships and a peaceful household. And then as we'll see in Proverbs, later on in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 11, when you live such a wise life with all the benefits of wisdom, you may even just add years to your life. See, it's clear that what Lady Wisdom offers is absolutely marvelous. Wisdom offers a satisfying life, a fulfilling life. But not only does wisdom uh, promise a fulfilling life in the here and now, what we see in verses three through six is that wisdom produces everlasting life. Wisdom produces everlasting life. So now her table is set, her banquet is prepared, Lady Wisdom now sends out her messengers to invite everybody to come and eat and drink and dine and feast with her. Look at verse 3. It says, She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Now, the highest places here probably refers to the city gates of Jerusalem, which would have been the highest uh, places, the high, highest elevation in the town. And the reason why these messengers went there was because they were inviting everybody. So they wanted to go to the highest places so the most amount of people possible could hear this invitation to Lady Wisdom's banquet. And what do these messengers say? Look at verses 4 and 5. 
Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. See, the invitation that Lady Wisdom offers is to those who are simple or or ignorant, those who haven't yet made a decision of, of which banquet they're going to attend, whose invitation they're going to accept. Now, what's required of those who want to attend her feast? Nothing. All they need to do is enter into Lady Wisdom's house. There's no cover charge. There's no dress code. There's no prerequisites. There's not even an RSVP required. The only qualification to enter into the banquet is one's own deficiency. And so are you seeing how this is an invitation of grace? Anyone can join the party. You don't need to get your act together. You can enter just as you are. You can eat and drink freely and you can eat to your heart's content. And when you do make the decision to enter into ladies, Lady Wisdom's house and enjoy her feast, you're no longer considered an indecisive, simple person. Look at verse 6. It says, you leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. See, accepting the invitation of wisdom means that you're forsaking all of your simple ways. It means that you won't just go along with the crowd and allow yourself to be led by the simple or the foolish. And it means that by the very nature of accepting wisdom's invitation, you're breaking ranks with the rest of humanity who are parading one after another into Madame Folly's house. And instead, you're going to enter the feast of wisdom, the banquet that ends in everlasting life. See, what... Lady Wisdom is really telling us in these first six verses, essentially, is everybody, turn away from your foolishness. Come to my palace where I'm throwing the greatest party. Stay with me and I will make you wise. I'll give you an abundant and eternal life. And in me, you will find satisfaction. See, this is the invitation of Lady Wisdom. And this invitation stands in stark contrast to the invitation that Madame Folly offers. Remember, in this chapter, we have a picture of two women competing for the the attention and and the affection of the sun. In verses 1 through 6, we read all about Lady Wisdom's uh, invitation to the sun and to everyone else to enter her banquet. And in those verses, we saw that accepting the invitation of wisdom leads to a life of satisfaction. Well, now, let's look at verses 13 to 18, where we see the invitation of Madame Folly. And it's in these verses where we see that accepting the invitation of folly leads to a life of sorrow. Accepting the invitation of folly leads to a life of sorrow. So again, two dimensions to this life of sorrow. The first dimension is in the here and now. In other words, folly promises an empty life. That's the most that folly can promise, is an empty life. So let's see what the wise father has to say to his son about Madam Folly, starting in verse 13. He says, the woman folly is loud. She's seductive and knows nothing. See, unlike... Lady Wisdom, in all of her luxury, all of her preparation, all of her wealth, Madame Folly is a shameless woman. She's seductive. She's deceptive. She's ignorant. And she lacks any moral knowledge whatsoever. She might come across as confident because of how loud she is, but that's just a bunch of hot air. See, the word folly here literally means shameless or or stupid. That's the, the English equivalent to folly is stupid. So, see, folly is only interested in herself, and her desire is to tempt you and seduce you bit by bit by bit until you find yourself in utter shame. And unlike Lady Wisdom, Madame Folly has no clue how to care for you. She spends zero time preparing to receive her guests. The only thing she spends her time doing is enticing those passing her by. Look at verses 14 and 15. It says, She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. See, unlike Lady Wisdom, who's up and about preparing the best for her guests and who sends out messengers to invite everybody who's willing to listen, Madame Folly remains seated. She sits. She's slothful. And she waits for her victims to come to her. Now, the picture here is of busy people going about their lives and everybody being busy except Madame Folly, who sits on her stoop trying to distract and detain anyone who will give her attention. And if you've ever been to the Atlantic City boardwalk, it's kind of like when you're walking down that crowded Atlantic City boardwalk, and as you're walking down, you notice in the corner of your eye a fortune teller sitting outside 
her shop. You know that if you were to make eye contact and look at the fortune teller, that she'd then invite you uh, to, to read your palm or to divine your future or something like that. Well, just like the slothful Madame Folly who lies in wait for her victims to come to her, if anyone glances her way, she offers an invitation too. But what's her invitation? Look at verses 16 and 17. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. It's the same invitation that wisdom offers. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. See, Madam Folly offers the same invitation that Lady Wisdom offers. They're, they're both calling out to the simple, hey you, turn in here, come in here, come dine and feast with me. Folly's prospective clients are the same ones that Wisdom reaches out to. So you can see here that really what's going on is there's, there's a battle of the banquets. There's a battle going on for you. There's a battle going on for me. And notice here next what's on the menu at Madam Folly's house. See, whereas Lady Wisdom offers a joyous, fulfilling banquet with choice meats and select wines, Madame Folly offers bread and water. And not just any bread and water. It's stolen water and bread eaten in secret. Now, these are references to, to those things, those sins that will taste sweet to us for a bit. They'll make us feel good for a short while but they don't offer any real sustenance whatsoever. These sweet sins offer no real or lasting satisfaction. They might taste good on the tongue, right? If you were to lick like artificial sweetener, it would taste really, really sweet, but it would leave you completely empty on the inside. It offers no sustenance at all. And this is unfortunately where so many in our world are headed. There's this uh, famous oil painting on display at the Louvre in Paris, and it's a painting called a Ship of Fools. So here's a, the full painting. We're going to zoom in on the bottom. When you look at the bottom, you, you, there's, you'll see 10 people uh, sitting in the boat, um, eating and drinking to their heart's content. There's two people swimming around the outside of the boat. But if you notice, the ship doesn't have a captain. Everyone on board is too busy indulging themselves in food and drink as they flirt and sing with one another, being clueless as to where the waves are actually pushing them. They're fools because they're enjoying all the sensual pleasures of this world without knowing where they're going. And then if you zoomed up into the middle of the picture, at the top of the mast, you see they're hanging a bunch of carrots, and there's a man there climbing up to reach them. But then above the carrots, at the very top of the picture... There's a small but very significant detail. You see there a human skull. You see, the idea is that these 12 fools, so distracted by their own desires, so consumed with themselves, so consumed that thinking everything is fine and dandy as long as they're indulging themselves, they're actually sailing right to their demise. And this is the kind of life, a life of foolishness, that so many in our world choose. But make no mistake, a folly, though it will taste good for a season, will leave you completely hollow and empty on the inside. See, folly promises an empty life, but the greater tragedy here, like we saw in the painting, is that folly produces everlasting death. Folly produces everlasting death. See, whereas wisdom produces everlasting life, Folly produces everlasting death. For the person who accepts the invitation of Madame Folly and turns into her house, he's going to find himself in quite a shock when he enters that house and realizes that the guests there are not living at all. They're actually dead. Look at verse 18. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. See, whoever accepts the invitation of Madame Folly does not know that inside at her table sit the ghosts of the dead. Whoever crosses her threshold and steps into her house, they're entering into the world of the dead. Now, as a huge Disney World fan, I could, as I was reading and studying this, I could not help but think of the ride Haunted Mansion. All right, so by those chuckles, I'm guessing many of you have been on there. So if you've been on that, you know that the ghost host, the guy who gives the narrative, he, he, he starts his narrative as you enter the mansion foyer. So did you pick up on that? He said, foolish, 
mortals. I don't think Walt Disney had Proverbs 9 in mind when he was making this ride, but it sure fits. And then he ends that by saying, there is no turning back now. Now, if you've been on the ride, as the ride continues, you remember you get to a scene where you see a bunch of dead people, a bunch of ghosts feasting at a dinner table. See, Madame Folly's house is not a house at all. It's definitely not a home. It's a mausoleum. And unlike the Disney ride, if you enter Madame Folly's house, you're not coming back out. Whereas Lady Wisdom offers a banquet of life in her palace, Madame Folly offers a banquet of death in her haunted mansion, if you will. See, the meal that Folly offers will taste sweet. It will bring pleasure. It will feel good, but for a short time. See, Folly is an expert at taking what is meant for good, removing the boundaries at which that good is given to us, twisting it, distorting it to make it taste even better, and then feeding it to us in the form of deceit and half-truths. But what Madame Folly refuses to reveal is the death that awaits those who accept her invitation. Like, a, like cattle walking to a slaughterhouse, the fool doesn't know that accepting her invitation is actually accepting the invitation to your own uh, funeral. Choosing the way of folly is a one-way street away from the good and marvelous things that wisdom has to offer. And so you're seeing the contrast here between Lady Wisdom and Madame Folly. Wisdom promises a fulfilling life. Madame Folly promises an empty life. Wisdom produces everlasting life. Madame Folly produces everlasting death. If you accept the invitation of wisdom, that's going to lead to a life of satisfaction. Whereas accepting the invitation of folly leads to a life of sorrow. So whose invitation are you going to accept? Because the decision that you make will have eternal implications. Are you going to choose the feast of wisdom? Or are you going to choose the scraps that folly has to offer? Now maybe at this time you're wondering, well, how can I know which path I'm on? How do I know if I'm taking the path of wisdom or if I'm taking the path of folly? Well, sandwiched between the two invitations that we just read in Proverbs chapter 9, right in the middle is a litmus test of sorts. In verses 7 through 12, it's as if the wise father is telling his son, son, there's two questions you could ask yourself to know which path you're on. Two questions that will give you an idea if you're parading toward wisdom or if you're parading toward folly. Here's the first question. How do I respond to godly correction? Look at verse 7. It says, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves or corrects a wicked man incurs injury. See, if someone tries to correct us or admonish us in love for the purpose of seeing us grow in our love for God and seeing us grow in our love for others, and we simply never accept that, it's saying that we're fools. That's what a scoffer is. A scoffer is anyone who never accepts any kind of correction. A scoffer is easily offended. A scoffer thinks that other people need his opinions. He doesn't need to hear anybody else's opinions. He writes off most of what the scriptures say. He thinks he's above other people. And if he interprets someone or something as, as damaging or challenging him or threatening his superiority, he scoffs. He mocks. He mouths off. He belittles the person. Now look at verses 8 and 9 says, do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. See, on the other hand, if we respond to godly correction with love and in humility, it's one evidence that we're walking the path of wisdom. In fact, such correction helps us, helps us grow in our wisdom. It will encourage us to turn away from the foolish things we're doing and to walk in the, down the path of wisdom. So that's the first question. How do I respond to godly correction? Well, the second question of the litmus test, if you will, um, an even more important question, I'd say the most fundamental question that could be asked is how do I relate to God himself? How do I relate to God himself Look at the next few verses, starting in verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. So see, this right here is the key to wisdom. Look again at verse 10. This is, by the way, the theme verse of the entire book of Proverbs, Proverbs 9, 10. And and it says right here, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. 
Now this is um, Hebrew parallelism. So what that means is the second line in Hebrew parallelism more clearly defines the first statement. So when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, we might ask what is the fear of the Lord? Well, it's right there. It says it's the knowledge of the Holy One. To fear God is to know God. See, the quest for wisdom, the pursuit of wisdom starts with having a personal relationship with God. So how do you relate to God? Do you know him? I'm not talking about knowing things about him. James says that even the demons believe that. I'm not talking about knowing just some things of God. I'm not talking about uh, rote, ritual, religious ceremony. I'm talking about, do you know God personally? See, wisdom is not this abstract thing that kind of just exists independently like, like the force or something like that in Star Wars. Wisdom belongs to a person. Wisdom belongs to God alone. And we're not talking about human wisdom here. Understand that the book of Proverbs knows nothing of human wisdom. Human wisdom is living life according to our own understanding, out of our own resources. The only wisdom the book of Proverbs, Proverbs knows of is divine wisdom. And that's the wisdom that we've been talking about. Wisdom that grows out of a personal, loving, intimate relationship with our Father. So think back to that portrait that the wise father here is painting for his son. He personified wisdom, and he called it Lady Wisdom, and he painted the satisfying and everlasting feast that she offers. Then he personified foolishness, folly, and called it Madam Folly, and he painted the sorrowful and death-infested meal that she offers. So let's step back to that picture again, and let me ask you, when it comes to deciding which path you're going to take. When it comes to deciding whose invitation you're going to accept, will you accept the invitation of wisdom or will you accept the invitation of folly? Now, if you say wisdom, you have to understand something. You're accepting the invitation of a person. See, wisdom is more of a who than it is a what. You're saying yes to a what. That's what divine wisdom would say. Or that's what human wisdom would say. Divine wisdom would say you're saying yes to a who. And who's the who? It's God. It's Father God. See, our New Testament brings this into crystal clear focus, exactly what's going on in Proverbs chapter 9. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 24, he said this. He said, Christ is the power of God and the what? And the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ is the power of God and he is the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ himself is the wisdom of God. He's the Proverbs wrapped in flesh. See, to accept the invitation of lady wisdom is to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Whereas to accept the invitation of folly is to reject Jesus. So you came in here today and I'm not sure where every one of you stand spiritually in relation to God. So if you're not sure where, you're, where you stand with the Lord or you know you're not a believer, uh, let me just speak to you for a minute. I want you to know that everything we've read about Lady Wisdom in Proverbs 9 is absolutely perfected in the person of Jesus. See, Jesus is the wealthy and wise one who has thought of everything that you need and he's provided it to you in full. Jesus lacks nothing you, you need. John 10 tells us that Jesus came that you may have life and not just any kind of life, but abundant life. And he invites you into the house he has built and he offers you his finished work. He offers you forgiveness of sins. He offers you redemption. He gives you the acceptance that your soul longs for. He provides you the security of knowing that you're a, an adopted, loved child of the Father and he provides you the answer for every longing that you can ever have. See, all these things are available to you right now in Christ. And just like the gracious invitation of Lady Wisdom, the invitation of Jesus is one of grace. You come just as you are. No prerequisites. There's no requirements to enter into his house and to feast at his table. See, because the feast that Jesus offers is not the garbage and scrap that folly offers. At Jesus' table, there's no junk food, there's no leftovers, there's nothing artificial there, there's no scraps. So the wisest thing you can do is to give your life to Christ. This is the biggest decision that will determine your destiny. So what are you gonna decide? See, to not make a decision for Jesus 
to not accept his invitation to wisdom is to reject Jesus. It is to reject his invitation. And Jesus came to earth and he lived a perfectly wise life so that he could take on the punishment of what our foolishness deserved. So make the decision that will determine your destiny, the decision to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And if you make this decision, the Bible says you are saved and your destiny is sealed. Now, what about for those of us who are believers? What's the application of this for us? See, if you feel like you've been struggling to make wise decisions, if you've caught yourself craving the crumbs on the floor instead of the feast on the table, I want to remind you that Jesus didn't just live the Proverbs perfectly for you, but that you need to allow him to live the Proverbs through you. See, living in the way of wisdom is impossible. It's impossible to live this way in our own strength. But as believers, we need to remember that we have the risen Christ at work in us. Look at the beginning of Galatians 2.20. Listen, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but who lives in me? Christ who lives in me. So yes, the Proverbs go against the grain of our flesh. Yes, the bar is set high, but Jesus in us will live the Proverbs through us. Jesus is our wisdom. He's our righteousness. He's our sanctification. In Christ is the very power of the Father. So let's stop settling for the temporary pleasures that the world offers. And let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the one who provides the joy and satisfaction and knowing that what he offers is infinitely more fulfilling than anything the world has to offer. Your destiny is determined by your decisions. The direction that your life takes is determined by the decisions that you make. And the greatest decision you can make is to accept Jesus' life that was given for you so you can allow him to live his life through you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for how convicting and illuminating your word is. Lord, I don't act to know what everybody's spiritual condition is in here, Lord, but for those who might be on the fence or for those who have not yet made a decision to follow you, Lord, I pray that even in the stillness of this, these moments, Lord, that um, in this attitude of prayer, God, that they would ask you for forgiveness of their sins, that they would accept your invitation to the incredible, satisfying feast that Jesus offers. And Lord, we thank you that this is an invitation of grace. Jesus, I'm reminded of when you told your disciples, get up and follow me. They didn't have to get their act together first. They didn't have to perform any kind of religious rituals It was all an act of grace. Stand up and follow me. Lord, so I pray that right now those people would put their faith and trust in you as their Lord, as their Savior, and as their life. And Lord, for those of us who do know you, who have already accepted wisdom's invitation, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us. God, that you would strengthen us, not in our own strength, but in the strength of the Holy Spirit that you've given to us. Lord, because we can't live life this way in our own strength. We need your grace. We need your strength. God, so get us out of the way and allow us to and give you the control center of our hearts. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.